you can see my the presentation which i shared right so are you guys familiar with the 2g or 3g telecommunication terminology or technology hello am i audible to all of you yeah now i have unmuted all the participants they can speak yes okay. oh. yeah so since uh, like what i will do here is i will just cover the on the overview of the lte technology so while covering there are 18 slides and uh, while covering the 18 slides you will get a rough idea about uh, what exactly meant by this lte or 4g technology so when you go to this 3gbp third generation participation project so there was a technology 2g which we call it as gsm then the 3g technology came which you will call it as umts so when we talk about gsm where well, it's more of tdd kind of technology where the uplink and downlink has been switched for a period of time for smooth communication and when it comes to technology it is umts umts stands for universal mobile telecommunication system where the technology used was wcdma it's wideband cdma and cdma means it's four, four division multiplex access and in umts the channel bandwidth was 5 megahertz and the user throughput achievable was 24 mbps or with mima technology it is 48 mbps and all and in umts or 3g generation technology we had multiple network elements and each of these elements are connected through the backhaul maybe cm or the backhaul was uh, optical fibers or different types of the backhaul was created but when it comes to the lt architecture the here this architecture is completely packet based architecture what i meant by packet based here is like the backhaul is fully ip backhaul and in 3g or 2g technology you in 2g te technology it was circuit switch, switch technology cs and when it was 3g it was both cs and ps circuit switched as well as packet switched so all your voice was circuit switched and all your data browsing everything was packet switched and when it comes to the lte that our the 4g technology it was completely packet switched there is no concept of circuit switch in lte because of this packet switched technology and this flat ip technology in lte we are able to manage the qos quality of service of the user in a better way and the delay between the user terminal which we will call it as ue ue in 3g between the user terminal to the end device 
is reduced due to advanced networking technology and in lte the network architecture is minimized or simplified so this all the just brief about lte and in lte the air interface ofdm technology is used that is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing technology is used in lte pc can you make uh, the presentation little bigger with uh, slide show yeah sure is it fine okay. yeah now it's fine yeah it's fine so this will just basically describe about lte what is necessity of the lte if you see that you see today like we all use the smartphones or the user hungry for user data has been increased which resulted in we want some new technology to serve the user requirement when it goes to wcdma initial phase of 3g it was 384 kbps was the throughput achievable then came the release 6 or the hsdpa hsupa technology so you hsupa hsdpa technology high speed downlink packet access that also part of the 3g technology so due to this technology the user throughput was increased to 14 mbps and using the advanced mimo concept and all it has been increased up to 48 mbps the lte technology the user throughput has been increased up to 300 to 400 mbps and currently in a market the companies or the people are working on the lte advance where in lte advance the 3 gbp recommends to get user uh, get the throughput of gb gigabits per second gbps so this is what the need of data and in lte since it's a flat or whole ip architecture our voice call has been and through oil or ims will coming to picture more in lte so this are basically about the lte from technology point of view so this just gives you the the market trend so if you see nowadays like everyone talking about the 4g technology deployment of lte technology and all so basically if you see the network technology earlier there was 2g technology and parallel to the gsm the 2g technology there is another technology called cdma technology basically few countries in asia basically few operator in asia and usa they are all using the cdma technology and in europe and some part of the other part of the world they are using the UPS technology. So, the CDMA technology has their own limitation on the data support. So, what happened was all the countries which were used CDMA technology, they want to go to the next technology, next generation technology, and they are moving into migrating into 4G technology. And the 3G technology, those who are using 3G technology. they are went ahead with hsp hsp a plus and then they will be slowly migrating into the lte and some of the country where there is just like for example in india and all some countries you have seen there is a good footprint of gsm technology and in few places you will find the the 3g technology and nowadays what happening is some of the places from gsm operators are directly moving to the lte technology So they are bypassing the 3G technology. So these are the market trend of the LTE technology. As you know that China is the market which had this PDSCDMA technology, which is equivalent of the WCDM technology. 
so nta also nte offering tdd that is time division duplexing as well as frequency division duplexing technology both so what do i mean to say that both the clever means there are two flavors of ltes are available so depends on the operators bandwidth or the telecom authorities licensing all those plays role on which technologies allowed in a particular country or particular state so basically the ltd serve the both tdd flavor and ftd flavor so this chart just explains you the throughput which i have explained earlier so here you can see that wcdm may the 384 kbps and in 3gpp terminology we will call something called release 5 release 6 release 7 terminology so this will contain the technical specification which says if you use this release functionality you should achieve particular number of throughput that's what you will see here at hsp release 7 and all and if you see the latency point of view you have seen that latency is very high in uh, wcdma technology and it has been reduced to 10 to 20 millisecond in lte technology and when it comes to the bandwidth the technology LTE हेलो कैन यू गो हेड ओके PC, you can carry on. No, okay, all, okay. all, all, all participants have been muted. Okay. If you anybody have any doubts or any question, just ping me in that chat window, so that I can stop and I can clarify your doubts if you have anything. So, so the another feature about LTE is the bandwidth of LTE is flexible. So what I mean by bandwidth flexible is LTE you can have <coughs> if the operator has 1.4 megahertz bandwidth he can deploy lte if he has 3 megahertz or 5 megahertz 10 15 or 20 megahertz he can deploy the lte technology but if you see other technology the bandwidth is the fixed is 5 megahertz required so there is another advantage of the lte and in lte we are using the higher order modulation schemes which is the modulation scheme part which i will cover at the end and when it comes to the architecture as i told is rnc based architecture where is the radio network controller will come that is another entity which i will show you in my next slide and when it talks about when i talks about the services you can see here that this wcdma supports cs and packet switched and uh, the hspa all those some hspa release 6 supports only ps but release 6 and 7 supports ps and cs technology so when it comes to the lte we have only ps that is packet switch technology and voice is carried through void on there is some other terminology technology also used to carry the voice if your network is not supporting the voice call and if user make a voice call in lte technology lte network then there is another provision called 
CS fallback, that is circuit switched fallback, where the user equipment will be redirected towards the, some other technology, either 3G or 2G technology to complete the user. So this slide is just, it talks about the <coughs> different, the release. So the initial phase of the 3GPP, where the first time the people have came up with release 99. Where the release 99, they defined the WCDMA technology, what, type, what are all the requirements, what are all the QAS requirements and all. The next version of Next version came out from the 3GPP is release 5, where they defined HSPA or HSDP, that is high speed downlink packet access. So, using this, the downlink throughput has been increased up to 40 Mbps. And the later version of the 3GPP is known as the release 6 3GPP, where they defined something called HSUPA, that is high speed uplink packet access. Again, you can see in the slide, the uplink throughput has been increased to 5.7 Mbps. The next, it came release 7, where people went to 2 cross 2 MIMO and higher order modulation and all. So they reached 28 Mbps. And in the release 8, you can see there are two flavors. One is HSPA plus where they achieved a throughput of uh, 42 Mbps initially and uh, release 9, they achieved 84 Mbps. Along with the release 8, 3GPP came up with another version in parallel, which is called as LTE or the 4G technology. So the initially that release 8 is the basic version of the LTE technology, where the downlink throughput of 150 Mbps and uplink of 75 Mbps was defined. And then the release 19, which it had much difference in the throughput path, but it had some optimization with respect to message handling, mobility and all. Then it came to release 10, which we call today as LTE advanced. So if I talk about release 10, where our 8 cross 8 MIMO and there is a new concept called carrier aggregation, where, you know, in LTE, there are bandwidth maximum available is 20 megahertz. If you have two, three 20 megahertz band, you can club together and you can get higher throughput. There's a technology called as carrier aggregation. So, which is supported in LTE advanced or release 10. And after release 10, the 3GPP had another flavor, release 11, release 12. And currently the release 12 is in uh, implementation point and release 13, the people are contributing to come up with the release 13 requirement. That's how this release concept comes from 3GPP. So, so basically in 3GPP, there are many operators, all the leading operators and many equipment vendors and many chip, chip makers all come together with a common understanding that in this release, this is the throughput we will be providing or this is the throughput required and they will come up with the specification. That is what we call it as 3GPP spec or 3GPP specification, which is freely which is freely downloadable. And uh, yeah, end of the presentation, I I will show you a couple of this presentation as uh, this specification numbers. And basically, like what defines this throughput requirement? So it's basically on the market trend. People will do the, some research groups will come up with the research says that this is the market requirement and then this technology comes uh, companies comes up saying that this is the technology limitations and basically due to this trade off they will come up with different releases and the requirements. 
and if you see currently in the market the terminology called iot internet of things and mtc mission type of communication all these are heard a lot and which is most widely start using in will be used or started using in all the industry and all segment so now the 3gpp in release 12 they prepare to handle this requirement of iot the data or mtc data and all so this is how the different releases are derived in 3gpp so okay this will just this slide will give you the sum of the just overview of how the lte technology has been simplified the network if you go to the hspa you will find there is something called a node b basically node b is the terminology for the base station if you see 2g technology you will call it as bts base trans receiver station bts in 3g terminology that is in 3g technology or 4g technology we call it as node b and initially it is known as node b that is e node b in lte technology so basically node b is the entity which will be directly facing to the air interface that means node b is responsible to transmit and receive the data from user equipment that is air interface and the behind behind the node b we call it as back hall that is between node b to the core network or you will find is it as ggsn in uh, hspa or ihspa technology so this is known as back hall and you will find multiple elements in this back hall there is something called rnc so basically this rnc is known as the radio network controller he is the guy who decides how how to handle the mobility that means user is making a call at one location and he is moving to some other place or the user is going in a bullet train where the speed is few hundreds of kilometers or miles or users are frequently on switch on switch off or users are frequently making lot of calls all those things are controlled by rnc basically rnc is responsible for all this messaging all this all this messaging and all the control plan plan activity towards the ue so the data which comes from node b and then it goes to rnc radio network controller then you have sgsn gpr serving node and you have ggsn is a gateway between the hspa technology to the other technology or to the internet service provider and all so in hspa plus they had a slight modification where the dark blue line that user plane data was bypassed between as ggsn and in hspa release 7 they further modified this network they clubbed the functionality of node b and rnc together they simplified the network and when it comes to the lte you will find all the networks elements having a different name so in lte the node b was known as e node b that is evolved node b and the mme comes to into picture instead of sgsn and you have something called gateway that is serving gateway and p gateway the pdn gateway so you can have the serving gateway and p gateway pdn gateway together and you can or you can have it at different locality everything depends on the network deployment so this is how the network architecture have been evolved so these are all the terminology used so the lte so lte is the long term evolution and eps there is another terminology most widely used in 
4G technologies, the EPS, Evol Evolved Packet System. That is a core network. When I say core network, this MME and S gateway plus P gateway club together known as core network. And your E node B is known as the radio access part. So your EPC and EPS evolved packet system contains evolved packet core, your core network as well as the EU cron. That is E node B part. So from the top level. This is how the network will look like. So you will be having multiple E node Bs, which is connected to the EPC, Evolved Packet Core, and which is connected to internet service providers. And you can see there are blue color lines, which we now uh, named as S1. And between the E node B, there is a meshed kind of structure that and it is named as X2. So basically these are the two interfaces available at E node B. So the S1 is the interface which will signal towards your packet core EPC and X2 is used between two E node Bs. So this is the new interface introduced this between two E node B, the X2 interface was a new interface. Basically, the use of this X2 interface is here the two E node B can talk among themselves for multiple reasons, maybe mobility, or if E node B1 finds there is a lot of interference from E node B2, he can just talk to E node B2 to reduce the interference or it can be used for other self optimization so in uh, 3gpp nowadays you will hear new word called son so son means self organizing network so basically this x2 interface is used for this that activity also so that is the use of the x2 interface So when I go to the next slide, what we did was that is the same slide, we just went with depth. So here you can see that the earlier slide you can see between E node B to the packet core, there's interface called S1. Now if I go here, I have split it or the it, it was S1 has been split into two parts now. There is something called S1U and there is another thing called S1 MME. So also you can see that S gateway slash P gateway or you can see there is an element called HSS. There is an element called policy and charging rule function and PDM. Basically, these are all the elements present in the EPC. So basically, MME is a mobility management entity. So he's the guy who does a lot of signaling work. So S1 MME is the interface used for all the control plane applications. That is all the signaling related aspects and user data that will be gone through S1U interface. That is, your user data will not be going to MME. User data will be directly going to the serving gateway. And from serving gateway, he will forward to PDN and the PCRF is a guy who takes, takes care of charging, billing, all those kind of activity. So there is something called HSS. So the HSS is the 
subs all the subscriber information that will be stored in the hss so when a user or the lte ue access the node b and he whenever he initiates the call uh, we call it as attach procedure the control plane message will comes to mme and mme will send the query to hss with uh, his uh, subscriber information so that now hss will be having uh, all the user detail where he was last visited that is last tracking area last area he was there and what is his the class of service everything and he is a authentic user all those information will be shared by hss so based on this information now the mme will take care of authentication or the security all those aspects and he will sends the message to the ue and basically these messages are called as nas message n a s stands for non access stratum so the access stratum is between lte to e node b is the access stratum and this something between lte to mme is known as nas so <clears throat> basically this e node b will not understand this nas message is it just transparent for the e node b so whatever the nas message comes from mme e node b directly forwards that to the ue it's just understood by only ue and mme here is just done this way to simplify the or the reduce the complexity in this message processing and for a ue to access this lte network this e node b will be transmitting or broadcasting some of the information and uh, we will call those information as system information basically e node b will be transmitting the plmn and e node b will be transmitting when you can what is my frequency or at which sub frame okay there is a concept called frame sub frame which will be taken care later part of the presentation so basically e node b will broadcast all the basic or required information and you will capture those information periodically he will listen to this information and he will access the network and i have told earlier that this 3gpp will come up with the different releases and different specifications so here you can see this couple of specification index there is something called 36.1 xx stands for is followed by some more numbers which defines about this base stations repeaters terminals specification and there is something called ts36.2 will define the physical layer dot 3 defines the mac rrc or other higher layers and dot 4 defines the mobility management and 36.5 xx defines the conformance testing so basically these are all the 3 gpp numbers or series basically so you can it's downloadable from 3 gpp.org 3 gpp.org so you can just google 36.100 or 36.300 or something you will find the specification so i had downloaded just now i had downloaded one particular specification I, I i'll show you that specification
So here, you can see this 3GPP specifications. So it defines the different technologies specification part and here you will find releases. Here you can find the different releases of the 3GPP. You can find these releases from release 99, 98, all those releases you will find here. Or if you know some release number, you can directly search those releases here. And I have downloaded the one of the release. So this is the 36300, which basically defines radio access overall description. So if you go, just go here, it will point to some more releases. Then there's a different definitions, what are the different terminology used. And it will define the overall architecture of this LTE. Basically, you guys can go through this 36300 and it's written Usually this 3GPP terminal uh, specification will be a bit complicated to understand for the first level users. But this 36300 will be pretty straightforward and it's simple and easy, easy to read or understand. So it will uh, just tell you the interfaces, S1 interface, X2 interface, user plane, control plane information, all those things. So, as of now, you may not be able to understand the name of this broadcast paging and all. So, maybe this all these parts we will be covering the later part of the training or presentation, and it will define different layers, MAC layers, and he will define what exactly MAC layer should perform. So, what is the functionality of the layer? You see here the 6.1 MAC layer. And he defines the services and functions of the MAC layer. And we'll in timing, we'll just skip these other parts, then let's go to the PDCP layer. PDCP stands for Packet Data Convergence Protocol. He defines what exactly PDCP layer has to do. He has to do the header compression, ROHC. He should take care of the in sequence delivery. He should take the SDO, serving datagram, packet datagram, PDO. Then he will define this. He defines ciphering basically. Basically, you know, like the, the, whatever the message sent from your UE should not be accessible by unauthorized devices or the users. So the data will be ciphered and it's integrity protected. So all those things are taken care by the PDCP layer. Next it comes to the RRC. So RRC stands for uh, radio resource controller. So again, he will decide, he will hear you tell the specification will tell what is the functionality of the RRC. So you may not be able to understand these things now. But he will define this, he will define that some measurement report, handover, basically mobility. All those things he will define.
then you will have he defined some of the identifier used and there is something called arc or hark so basically this hark are all the how to handle the transmission ray transmission everything will be defined here if you come further he will define the mobility he will define the mobility management in different cases that is you are browsing a web page and you are moving now so how the mobility will be should be managed at the network side that is what he defined when it is in connected state and he defines okay you are not browsing you just kept your mobile in your pocket wallet and you are just moving so he will define how to handle this idle mode mobility and basically you are now you are at open area or you are at uh, close to the base station so the signal quality may be good now you are going in elevator or you are in a ground ground floor or you are in somewhere else where the signal quality may not be good so now the network has to take care of your call network has to decide should i move this guy to some other e node b or should i provide him the more resources or what should i do what is the switch so these are all the things defined by these specifications so now i assume you guys got a fair idea of 3gpp specification here you define is a release nine similar way you will find it release 10 and release 11 where they will define the different functionalities the network should support so basically the intention of showing this document is for you guys to understand that what exactly mean by 3gpp specification and what exactly meant by a release and timing in case can ignore this content so i had open 36.300 so where you will find this is i had explained mac radio link controller and radio resource controller so all the functionality of these three layers are defined in this specifications so this was basically the standard so let's now let's come to the implementation part of this let's assume 3gpp came up with the release called release 9 or 10 and when you go you will just go to 3gpp and you will download those releases documents and you will read the document and the document will say xyz that is the downlink throughput should be some mbps uplink should be x mbps and the mobility should be So, should be in this manner or the qas it should be it should be in this way or the the latency should be so much millisecond all those things are defined in the 3gpp specification now the system requirement gathering so basically this system requirement gathering is uh, tightly coupled with the uh, the market trend and what exactly 3gpp defined that is 3gpp and the technology what is my capability let's assume that the 3gpp defines you need to support higher very higher order modulation and if i am not ready with my technology i can't support that so that's what the meant by technology here or my capability so the system requirement gathering are mainly driven by 
system engineering team or the architects and they will closely sit with the marketing team to understand what is the requirement of the operators or what exactly the market wants and they will come up with this system requirement document and different company will have this uh, different naming convention for this documents and all and once this system requirements are gathered that will be frozen say the company x they will tell they will come up with a system requirement for themselves for internal purpose saying okay we will develop this module this uh, enode b in release 9 capable with following so many number of users x y z and all so this system requirement will be moved into further then it comes to the development the guy who is actually developing so what they does they just convert this requirement into the software code or they will convert this whatever written in this word document into some software module which will function as defined by this requirement document so in between this system requirement gathering and development there will be teams like who are we working on different algorithms and uh, different flow charts different process everything will come into picture and once it comes to the software development the next part will be the testing and verification so basically the testing and verification is just ensure that whatever i have defined in my system requirement or whatever the market required and whatever i have developed are in sync there's a function of the testing or the verification team so during this process there will be multiple simulators or the tools will be used and when it comes to the development it can be developed with c program or it can be developed with c++ program all those choice has to be taken from the company or the architects or the it's tightly coupled with the hardware or it's tightly coupled with your company and all so when it comes to the testing so there are a lot of different test equipments are available so there are there is a testing dependency on these test equipments to ensure this smooth verification of the technology so when it comes to the testing so there is a test methodology like how you are following the testing which can vary from company to company and you have to define what is test environment suppose you want to test the mobility feature so you should have the equipment to support that mobility or you want to test the user throughput of uh, just check whether user 300 mbps throughput you are reaching or not so you should have the test ues or you should have the simulator for the core network or you should have simulator for e node b to ensure the software whatever you are having is behaving properly and deriving the test cases so once you have the system requirement that will be sent to the development team for the development and it will be sent to the testing team for the testing purpose and this basically this development team will come up with something called functional specification requirement or high level design document or they we can have a something called low level design document testing team will come up with the test cases where they will come cover the scenarios used cases what is the expected outcome all those things will be a part of this test cases so basically the test cases rating and this high level design document from the development team all will be go can go in a parallel and that depends on the test methodology followed by this company or the organization and once the software is available it will be tested by using referring the test cases written and people will be validating and ensuring that the function is that is proper and nothing has been broken and and they have to analyze the outcome 
or if something is not functioning in properly for example in 3 gbp release 9 you are expecting a throughput of 70 mbps and you are getting just 10 mbps or 20 mbps of the throughput then yes you have to debug you have to check why there is a low throughput what is wrong is there something wrong in my test environment which is creating this issue or is there really some problem with this software which is creating the issue or the equipment which i am using is it faulty so basically the testing guy has to come up with just to analyze or the debug the logs by take help of different equipment and all he has to come up with okay there is a problem with the software or no there is a problem with my test environment i need to work it on my test equipments so basically he does that then the once he does the debugging then he has to report the issue to the development team or the ir authorities so there are different tools are available some other free tools are available for reporting the bugs there are some tools called mercury bugzilla and all or quest to raise the tickets or just to follow up the debugging and there is another activity will be done by the testing team is called as regression regression is just to ensure that there is nothing has been broken due to the new feature for example the release you are the company is working on release 10 now you guys are already delivered release name features but when you are delivering the release 10 features you should ensure that whatever the previous features release name features are not broken they are working properly then you have to come up with some regression testing you have to come up with some test cases for this regression activity and you have to perform the testing that is known as the regression testing there is something called the stability let's assume that you have a e node b which is giving you a throughput of whatever the market expects maybe 300 mbps or 200 mbps but the stability you need to check whether my system will work for days whether my system is work or system will work flawlessly for 100 users when there is a lot of users making a call going away hand over all those scenario whether my system is stable i need to check so that is a part of this stability testing so these are all the some aspects of this testing maybe in depth we can cover later and when they call it as test methodology we call something called software life cycle sdlc software design life cycle so there are different flow, different models are available are followed basically there are some models called v model and these models are uh, not related to telecommunication this is the most widely used across all the technology there are v model water flow model and current hello thank you yeah hello yeah is it yeah yeah uh, screen is visible yeah it's visible right okay fine okay so i'll go ahead to this development aspects 
So as I defined earlier, this high level design document, low level design documents, then they will code it, they will review internally. Then development team will come up with their unit testing. That is, let's assume that the guys will develop different modules or different protocol, different layers of the protocols. They will test that whether the layer is functioning properly or are they satisfying all the requirements and all. And then they will release that to the QA, quality analysis or testing team. So basically this testing team will do all the testing activities and release to the next level. And there are some tools like SVR or the TRPs or many tools are available, freely available for this development purpose to track the different software releases. And some of the tools at UE side or the user equipment side, there are tools called QXGM or QCAT and there are some test UEs like TM500 or there are some test UEs like FFAs are all available in field. And for the RF testing, there is something called TEMS. There are different drive test tools are used. And there's a traffic generator like uh, the backhaul. You want to simulate different kinds of the traffics, point traffic or the burst in nature of the traffic. So there are some freely available tools are there like Hyperf, JPerf, or Ixia or some other companies also providing these different traffic generators. And the spectrum analyzer, basically this RF side, we want to check whatever E naught B transmits, is it really reaching the UE properly? So this part will be taken care, of. this can be validated using the VSA or MXCS. There are different types of signal generators that will be used. And if you want to trace the traffic in the back hall, then you need to use this Wireshark or t -shark. Or there are some companies like JDSU, they all come up with the different testing tools or the debugging tools, which can be used. So that's all about this uh, presentation. So I have four slides on this uh, modulation scheme. So in LTE, we are using the modulation scheme of QPSK, 16 pop and 64 pop. So QPSK. So it is basically quadrature phase shift key. And here you can see that two bits will be transmitted in QPSK. Then it comes the 16 QAM. QAM stands for amplitude modulation. So in the 16 QAM, there will be four bits will be transmitted from E node B per symbol. And then there is something called 64 QAM, where there's a 16 bit will be transmitted per symbol. So these different modulation schemes are used to achieve the higher throughput on different conditions. For example, this QPSK, you are transmitting just two bits per symbol. So if I, if I send data using QPSK, I will get very low throughput or low data rate. Then E not B may go for 16 pump or 64 pump. But let's assume that the channel condition, that is the interface between UE and E not B is very bad. For example, let's see that you are very close to base station or you are in a ground, ground surface or somewhere. Then we are assumed that the channel condition will be good then you will be able to decode 16 pop or you will be able to get very high throughput. But 
let's assume that you are moving inside a building or you are going in a tunnel then the channel condition will not be that good then the your ue or e not be may not be able to decode the 60 uh, 64 qam signals that will results in usage of 64 qam signal on bad radio will results in the crc error or the data check error then e not be has to shift to the 16 qam or if let's assume that the user is in very bad radio condition let's assume that is it is a raining or whatever may be the condition then user equipment may not be able to decode the 16 qam also then e not be has to schedule the data with qps this is how this is the requirement of having the different modulation scheme in this lte technology so basically there are some measurement will be performed by the ue and he will be periodically reporting those measurement to e not b and based on this measurements e not b will decide okay how is this user is he in good radio condition or is he in bad radio condition and they will be they will be scheduling the users in different modulation scheme so basically this are all the the slides i had prepared for today's presentation if you have any questions please let me know i can try to answer those questions now or Uh, if i not able to get the answer to answer i can answer that questions in next presentation also so what you are doing here in general so yum is course separately controlled depends of the theory class and hello हेलो Sasank if you have any query S A S A N K yeah, I'm fine okay now uh, I'm I'm coming to Sasank Sasank do you have any query to we'll discuss with trainer no I'm fine right uh coming to suman suman are you there suman are there anything to discuss from your side my don't yeah it's fine right uh then uh, sunil sunil do you have any doubts or queries hello fine i am not getting any voice from him he may be from phone i have another participant by name vachas v a c h a s vachas do you have any doubts no sir okay because if i unmute all the guys uh, that is a lot of disturbance uh, is happening i know somebody will be busy vignan vignan yeah i am fine okay thank you so abhinav is there any doubts from your side uh, no sir i am good good okay i don't know some some our participants have uh, joined with ipad maybe maybe from their phone am i audible to you sir there is no response okay now i am unmuting karthik karthik do you have any doubt uh, no it's good actually fine 
Now I am going to Kranti. Kranti, do you have any doubt? Uh, no, it's fine. Okay, thank you. And uh, now I am unmuting Mauriteja to talk. Mauriteja, do you have any doubt? Maurya Teja. Fine. Uh, I am going next to Nag. Nag V. Nag, do you have any doubts? No, no, I am good. Okay. And uh, now uh, coming to Nitesh. So no, I am fine, sir. Teach for your children. First, you have to make yourself as a child. Is then you need to teach children. I am fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm unmuting the trainer uh, now. Uh, uh, PC, I have some doubt. Uh, uh, let me put my doubt like this. See, yeah. we all we all in the team are we are beginners. Even I'm, I am. Yeah. I don't know about LTE. Okay. Is this a big rocket science to learn, or we can learn because we all are uh, graduates and post graduates in engineering and masters. We don't have mm -hmm. any any radio frequency embedded system knowledge. Okay. By by so, re by referring the books and the training videos or any other things, if we can uh, cope up with hardware activity, then it's fine yeah. for us. If I am not wrong. Yes, yeah, you can. Okay. But the uh, the layer one, that is physical layer. Yes, sir. Which is a bit difficult to learn from okay. implementation point of view because. You know, the physical layer will be tightly coupled with the hardware also. Okay. And it's morely coupled with the close to the close with the hardware also. Okay. So, yes, you can refer the book and you can understand how it will behave and all. But the yes. upper layer, that is the layer 2 or MAC 2 above layer and all, it is easy to learn also. Fine, fine. Maybe this, maybe this training, all those things can helpful for you that. But the physical layer, I feel it will be a bit difficult to understand every aspects by referring the documents or anything. Okay. But there are some good textbooks are available. Okay. You can refer those textbooks also to get good idea about this physical layer and all. Okay. And. Uh, as I shown you that that uh, specification 36300. So the beginner can just read those specification and uh, they can try to understand something because that is that will be that is very simple and it's a, it is a straightforward there written. So it's it will be easy for all the beginners to understand what exactly LTE or what is the use of uh, different layers and all? Okay, sir. So thank you guys. Thank you for attending uh, uh, the introduction program. The next session uh, will be day after tomorrow. That will be mailed to you about the curriculum and all the details. Okay. So uh, it will be day. It will be day after tomorrow. The timing and the links will be sent on mail. Thank you, Mr. PC. Thanks for your time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.